Good morning, folks. This is Pastor Don Golden again coming to you from Calvary Ministries. I want to thank you for all the uh, time that you spend tuned in with us. I pray that you receive God's blessing from every session that we have together. I pray for every blessing that God can give to you. Uh, we will be going back to the book of the Revelation, continuing our series this morning. And we will be this morning in Revelation chapter 3 and begin with verse 7. This is the sixth letter of the letters that Jesus writes to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And this one is to the church at Philadelphia. Now, a bit of a background on Philadelphia. Philadelphia was located about 25 miles southeast of Sardis. And Sardis, you remember, was the church that we've talked about over the last three weeks in different lessons and approaches to it. But Philadelphia was a very small town located about 25 miles southeast of Sardis, in present-day Turkey. At that time, ancient times, it was called Asia Minor. The city was founded uh, back about 159 to 138 BCE by a king named Adalus. Uh, king Adalus was uh, known for his great love for his brother. And over the years, the town became known as Philadelphia, which is another word in the Greek for brotherly love. And it was named so Philadelphia, again, because of the great love between King Adelus and his brother when the city was founded in 159 to 138 BCE. The ruins are still available today in present-day southwestern Turkey to look at. Not much, but there are ruins there. The word literally means brotherly love. We look at that, a term of brotherly love, and we look for examples in the scriptures where it talks of brotherly love. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 gives the command to those who are in this region. He, of course, Peter is writing from the prison where the death sentence is already upon him, and he's waiting to be executed. But Peter writes, and he says to all those that he's writing to, love as brethren, love as brethren. And he uses this Greek word when he describes that love that he wants them to have one to another. Paul, again, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Brotherly love. Same word is used again. The, for the brotherly love. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. And Peter writes those that he's sending his letters to, and he says, Obey the truth through the Spirit with unfeigned love of the brethren. Now, I always like the words of Jesus when we look for authoritative teaching. Jesus was the ultimate preacher, teacher. He was the very incarnate God. He was the Son of God. He was God manifested in the flesh. He came to us to save us from our sins. In the book of John, the same apostle who wrote this revelation, chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, the words of Jesus are recorded. And Jesus says there from those writings, 
love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. He says then, to close that in 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So this city of Philadelphia, the very word of it, the very name of it means brotherly love. And Jesus talked about the need for us to love one another again and again. Peter talked about it. Paul talked about it. You know, this was one of the very hallmarks of the early Christian church, the unique brotherly love that they had one for another. So Jesus writes this letter to the church at Philadelphia. And if we go to verse 7 to start our study and our sermon for today in the book of Revelation, we read these words. Jesus talking to the church via the apostle John. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Now you remember that that word angel is another way of Jesus addressing the pastor of the church. You can go back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20 and it gives that definition of the word angel. Jesus says, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. This is the longest of the introductions that we find in the, the letters to the seven churches. And I want to take time so that we properly understand how Jesus identifies himself here because what he says is what we need to know when we talk about Jesus, the very Christ, the presence of Almighty God in our lives. We need to have the faith and the understanding of who it is that we believe in and who it is that we are confessing. These things saith he that is holy is that very first part there in the, in, in the introduction that Jesus makes uh, here in verse 7. Let's look at that. He that is holy. If we go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, and verses 1 to 2. This is what is written. God is speaking unto Moses. It says there, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Remember now, we're going back to that word holy because Jesus has identified himself as he that is holy. It goes here in the book of Leviticus and it says that we are to be holy because God is holy. God and Jesus the Christ are one of the same, one and the same. You have a holy God, you have a holy Jesus, you have the holy manifestation. We're going to talk later about the Holy Spirit, but God is completely holy. If you go to the book of Isaiah, the great prophet Isaiah, he says there in chapter 6 and verse 3, listen to this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth, earth is full of his glory. Isaiah saw God as he who was the creator of all. He who was the very giver of breath of life and the very soul of man. 
He that knows all things, he that understands all things, he that loves all things, he whose grace in salvation goes beyond the understanding of man. Isaiah says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This word holy in the Hebrew is kadoshe, kadoshe. And what does it mean in the Hebrew language? It means completely free of sin or any uncleanness. It means perfection without equal. It means free of any taint whatsoever, perfectly clear. It's free of any corruption, free of any wrongdoing. It is used to describe the complete, absolute righteousness of Almighty God. That word is called Doshe. Let's go to the book of Luke. And I'm going to take the time to read this because it is so important to everything that we're saying today. And I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 30 through 35. It says there in the scriptures, And the angel said unto her, the her being Mary, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Listen, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the very Spirit of God. And the, highest, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, listen to this word, that holy being who shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The use of that word holy. Now, we gave you the Hebrew definition for the word holy. Here it is in the Greek. And that word for holy, for that holy being, holy, that's used here is hoesos, hoesos, and it literally means ultimate purity, free from any defilement, free of any wrongdoing. It is of divine character, unpolluted, unstained by any type of of sin or wickedness. Hosesos. Hosesos. That same word is used again in 1 Peter. We talked about 1 Peter a little earlier when we were talking about love and brotherly love. But it's used here regarding the people of God. And Peter writes under divine inspiration, but you are a chosen generation, 
a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter saw us that once we have received God's salvation and once we were discipling in the holiness of Almighty God, that we literally become a chosen people, a holy nation, a peculiar people unto the calling of Almighty God. And what is that calling? A calling out of darkness, and darkness being symbolic of the sin of our lives before we reach salvation in Jesus the Christ through the very power of salvation in Almighty God. We move from that darkness into that marvelous light. Marvelous. What an adjective to describe it. One that talks about a light that is beyond our everyday experience absolutely marvelous and Peter says again that we are a chosen people I look at the world today the way it is and sometimes we can get caught up with all the negative news and all the things that are being said about the the things that man does wrong the murders the thefts the slanders the hatred, the bickering, the wars, the killing of each other, sometimes a hundreds at a time. And it's easy to think that, you know, all has been lost, but Peter says here that holy God has chosen people to be his holy nation a peculiar people that will show forth the praises of God who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Yes, there is a lot of wickedness in the world, and I will not tell you that it's not there. There is a lot of evil. There is a lot of sin. There is a lot of hatred and a lot of bitterness. There is a lot of harm that seems to occur. But the love of God is far greater than all of that. And the God whom I serve, Jesus the Christ, who is the giver of my salvation, is greater than all these things. All these things. For God is holy. God is holy, holy, holy. He is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of of the glory of God. That's what Isaiah said back there in chapter 6 and verse 3. Now Jesus goes on there in his letter to the church at Philadelphia, and he identifies him after he says that he is the one that is holy. He identifies himself as he is the one that is true. He is the one that is true. John, again, this apostle, whom we are reading the writings of and who we are preaching this sermon from. John in chapter 17 and verse 3 has this to say. He says, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, talking about Jesus, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Jesus says here beyond his holiness that he is the one that is true. John in chapter 17 of his writing and verse 3 says that not only is Jesus in God one the same, as the true God 
of all the ages. But he is the one in whom we have life eternal. Believe in Jesus the Christ as your Savior. Confess him as you repent of your sins. And the promise from Almighty God is life eternal. That's a promise that comes from the only true God. If we read on there in the book of John, we have these words. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we might know him that is true and we are in him that is true. Notice that word. And in his son Jesus Christ we find the true God and eternal life. I want to close this morning with this thought to you. There was a time when Thomas the apostle came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, now this was the disciple, he was a disciple at that time, Thomas came to Jesus and he said, how can we know the way to this great truth? And Jesus said to him these very words. He said to him, I am the way, now listen to the next word, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If we sum up this sermon today, it comes to this. God of creation, God of all the ages, God of all knowing, God of all power, God of all presence, God of all understanding, God of all love, God who is holy has created a plan of mercy and love and grace in the only begotten Son who is the truth that was given here on this earth that we might know what is true. His name was Jesus whom we call the Christ. If you want to have salvation from your sins this morning here is how simple the process is it is the free gift of God you don't have to do anything except this simple prayer God I know that I am a sinner and God I believe that you sent your only begotten son holy and true so that I might have forgiveness of my sins. God, I pray your forgiveness as I confess Jesus the Christ as my Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen.